mice suffer like humans or do humans suffer like chimpanzees or vice versa? You know, to me that's a non-question because do I suffer like you? Well, I might not, but it doesn't mean that I'm not suffering. And it's just a myth. You know, people say that, well, you know, the smaller animals don't feel as much pain or joy as larger animals, but that's, I mean, no biologist in the world could ever make that statement credibly. There's just, it's just silly. We all have the same basic brains. And so when I hear, you know, they'll, they'll, people will say, well, you know, chimpanzee or elephant or possum suffering isn't like ours. Well, it, who cares whether it's like ours? They have their own sort of suffering. I mean, my suffering might not be like yours, but it doesn't mean that you suffer and I don't, or vice versa. And once again, no, no credible scientist I know would ever make that claim. Although, you know, a lot of cultures where animals are harmed have these ceremonies and these rituals, and the reason they have the ceremonies and rituals is because they know they're harming the animals. I mean, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as we'd say here in the States. Maybe you say the same thing down there. So, you know, you have animal welfare legislation. You have certain rules that apply to animals in captivity to give them the best life you can in those conditions. So all those legislation, all those rules, all those regulations, all the laws are based on the fact that they do suffer, because if we thought they didn't suffer, then you wouldn't have any laws. The people is think of your at home, you know, the companion animals at home. Would you do it to a dog? And they'll go, oh, never. And I'll go, well, why do you do it to a possum or a mouse or a rat or a chimpanzee? Just to get the discussion going. Yeah. You know, it's not a joke, but people say, well, yes, you know, Wildlife management down in Australia and New Zealand is really wildlife killing. And um, and that's what it's been. Yeah. And I think, the pre you know, this predator-free New Zealand program, like predator-free by 2050, is centered on blood and on killing. It, I mean, anybody who says it's not, you know, or people go, well, you know, we don't really want to kill the animals, but if it's done humanely with compassion, you know, tell that to my dog. <laughs> you know, I'm going to kill you humanely with compassion. Exactly. And so, people really have, you know, people really have to learn that they're causing a lot of suffering. And of course, I've written a, a lot about the school programs where they're teaching kids to harm animals and do horrific things to animals, to basically ensure that that will be the culture that is. Um, that goes into the future. Exactly. Um, do you have options to predator-free that you can elaborate on? Predator-free 2050. <coughs> well, I mean, sure. One option is to just let nature take its course. Okay, and and I value the lives of the animals who are being killed by so-called invasive animals. I mean, they suffer too, but uh, you know, they could do things like maybe use what we call chemosterilants, you know, put out chemicals into the environment that render the animals non-reproductive, for example. Um, I think we need much better data on how much damage really is done because people really do disagree. Um, and one thing would be just to say, we're not going to do any killing and this is, and we're going to find non, um, lethal alternatives to dealing with whatever problems are at hand. Gin would be banning 1080. I mean, it would just, it would just say 1080 is out. And so are traps and snares. Because so many of these animals, when they get trapped or snared, they don't die. They die a very slow death. And there's a lot of pain and suffering. But, but you know, if you really want to think of how you could begin to do this work, um, the first move would be banning all these poisons like can just saying they are not, they're not, the, their use is not on the table, cannot, they're, they're gone. It sounds like they have been banned overseas, but New Zealand is the only one. Ariel yep. is dropping it. Yeah. Yes, you know, a number of countries have banned it, it's horrible, okay. you know, it's, you know, it's, 
it causes incredible pain and suffering. And it's, and it's very um, nonspecific. You know, you put it out, animals eat it. Animals eat an animal who died of it, and it spreads. We call that in biology biological magnification, and that would be the spread of these poisons in, into ecosystems among animals who were not intended to, um, you know, be tortured, if you will, because 1080 is torture. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, the way I look at it as a biologist is that ecosystems are dynamic entities. And so at, one, at any one time, you can say an ecosystem is healthy or not healthy or rich and diverse or not rich and diverse. So I don't know what it means to damage other than if you want to compare an ecosystem today. And, and this is what people are doing. They're comparing an ecosystem today to how it was before these invasive animals were there or and stuff. But to me, it's it's not a very fair comparison because the ecosystems today, even if they were, quote, healthy, would be very different from the ecosystems that were there a long time ago. And then the other important thing that good conservation biologists really factor in is, you know, how do you define invasive? How do you define non-native? I mean, some of these animals have been there for hundreds of years. They're embedded into the dynamics of an ecosystem. So therefore, pulling them out damages the ecosystem. My take is that we need more of a hands-off policy, and we definitely need to allow ecosystems to go. They cycle. I mean, this, this is just what they've done naturally for millennia. Totally. Um have you been described as um, crazy? I know that's yeah. because <laughs> no, it is I mean, an out there subject. I like that question. Um, my answer that I wrote down was yes and no, but but in all honesty, I think, and I'm, I, I don't think I'm wrong here. I really I try as hard as I can to listen to all sides of an argument. Okay, so with respect, so if I disagree with somebody and they disagree with me, I'm willing to engage with them as long as there's mutual respect. And they were very polite, they were very informative, I didn't agree with what they were saying, they didn't agree with what I was saying, but at least we respected one another's views. And, and I'm willing to engage in that because I can learn. I can learn from them, they can learn from me. And yes, some people say, I don't know, some guy said that I was a total whack job and that I must have bought my PhD. <laughs> Um, I never really thought it was hard to get people to listen. There was a lot more resistance. They'd kind of listen to you and blow you off. So they'd say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we don't really know that dogs enjoy playing. We don't really know that rats being tortured suffer. But times are changing really fast with respect to those views on animals. I mean, I, I honestly do not know a, any credible science scientists who would question whether animals have emotions. Now, they might question the depth of them. You know, they might question certain things, but they definitely don't question that. They're changing. You know, I just get a lot of emails from younger people in New Zealand and, you know, elsewhere in the world who are just tired of the killing that's going on in conservation. They're just tired. And it's wonderful when they're graduate students or advanced undergraduates who are planning a research career, because those are the people you really want to talk to. She wrote me and she okay. said, I'm really upset at what's going on, and I have other friends who are, but we don't know where to go. And so I said, this is great. I put them in touch with three people at SAFE in Wellington, and they are working together. Wonderful. And then I wrote this one article, I don't know if you saw it, where... You know, a mother basically said, can you please help my daughter? My daughter doesn't want to do this stuff, but she's shamed at school, or her teachers say you have to do this. And so it was wonderful. So it's a great question you're asking. I think the younger kids are much very open to um, humane solutions, if you will. It's so wrong to tell somebody else they have to kill an other animal. It's just wrong to tell them they have to do that. What I'm amazed at 
because a lot of the people who do this killing are very bright. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, they're dumb. Well, a lot of them are pretty bright, and they're creative. So just put killing on the table. Just say, killing is no longer an option. And I bet you if there was a moratorium on killing or it was just removed from the menu of alternatives, then they'd come up with solutions. And then, okay, there is hunting. I don't like hunting. I don't like fishing. But the point is that we're dealing now, say, focusing on the predator free by 2050 program. So we should focus on that. Um, let, you know, if, if, if one is interested in it. And if they're not, then they can just focus on hunting or some, whatever, you know, dairy farming, farming, you know, food farming, animal, food animals. But I think it's really essential to focus. Number one, we have limited time and energy and money. And number two, I think that the best results come from when people just identify, say, the situation in which they're interested, and then they work very hard on that. Yeah, no, I mean, it surprises me that conservation groups and some animal welfare groups have not just very explicitly come out and say, no more killing. Well, I mean, the only thing I was going to say is scientists aren't supposed to talk about feelings and compassion. You know, science is supposedly objective. It's not. You could give the same data set to five people and get five different interpretations. So that's just baloney or whatever you want to call it, that that science is objective. It's not. If science were objective, then the things that some people are doing to animals, not only in New Zealand, but throughout the world, they would never do. I mean, they just would never do it because the data show that they don't work. So, you know, people just pick and, they, you know, we call it a cherry pick. Oh, we like this because it agrees with us. We like this because it agrees with us, but we don't like that because it doesn't agree with us. And you, you can't have it both ways. I mean, the basic message there is that we need to reconnect with nature and we need to do it from our hearts. We really need to feel <coughs> what other nature is feeling, but it's reconnecting with nature as a whole, ecosystems, animals, um, and their homes. And the rewilding is the reconnecting and becoming re-enchanted with nature, and it's driven by our heart. And then if you have certain feelings in your heart, then that will those feelings will produce actions that you hope will be beneficial and positive. Oh, <clears throat> my parents would say that I've been doing this since I'm around three. Um, I, I wrote a book called Minding Animals, and they said that when I was a kid, I always would ask them what other animals were feeling and what they were thinking. I was very concerned about how squirrels were doing. I, I grew up in, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, a city. And um, and I would always ask them, oh, how's that, what's, what's that bird thinking and feeling? What's that squirrel thinking and feeling? And so I think I've been doing this stuff for many, many, many years. and. And it's just very natural to me. I mean, I, I feel the pain of other animals. You know, I don't mean that in some soft and fluffy way, but when I look at animals experiencing joy, I feel their joy. And when I look at them expressing pain, suffering, I feel their pain and suffering. And I don't think it's anything magical. I mean, part of it, I think, is simply that we're all, you know, especially with mammals, I mean, we have the same brains. So. I see them in a situation that would cause me pain and suffering or joy, and I can imagine how they're feeling.